know that I'm Sister Linda. I'm the Vice President of Redemption and Ministry. And it is my pleasure to be able to welcome you to our Lunch and Learn this afternoon with Sister Kathy Gill. Uh, and it is indeed our privilege and our pleasure, Kathy, to have you with us you. today. When I asked Kathy about a bio, she said, keep it simple and brief. So um, Very brief. we'll do that. Um, first of all, Kathy grew up in Geyser, Iowa, which is north of here, and she was educated here at Mount Mercy as an educator. And she has served as a teacher and an administrator in Iowa, Minnesota, and Montana. One of the things that I know about Kathy is that she has many loves, and education is indeed one of those, but she also loves her family, she loves cooking, and uh, she loves the cups. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I yeah. also get my right. because of all of those loves. But more so, one of the things that I know about Kathy is that she has a passion for those who are poor and a, a real passion for who they are as well as responding to their particular needs. She has served in a variety of ministries doing that, from establishing and administrating a center for families with AIDS and HIV in Chicago. She's worked on the border with immigrants living in the colonias of South Texas. She has um, supported the underserved through the House of Mercy in Waterloo. And she has also served as the ministry director for the Sisters of Mercy. And she said she did that until she retired in 2015. And I would beg to differ with that. Um, she is not indeed retired, but I think her story today will indeed inspire us of the work that she continues to do. Uh, she currently lives here in Cedar Rapids and she volunteers at the Community Health Free Clinic Captain McCauley Center, as well as Sacred Heart Convent. And with this, let us give her a warm mercy welcome to Kathy Bell. Thank you. thank you, Linda, and thank you for the invitation to be here to participate in Mission Week um, here at Mount Mercy. It's a wonderful tradition, and I just hope all of you enjoy it delight in it and learn a lot through it. So thank you. Our name is mercy. Our spirit is compassion. My personal commitment to these words caused me to look more closely at the plight of the asylum seekers, those large caravans of immigrants trying to enter our southern borders and get safety. Immigration has captured the news media a lot in the last few years. There's so much attention about the border, about those trying to get into the United States. Today, I'm only speaking about a group of immigrants known as the asylum seekers. These are persons who flee their home country because of personal dangers, abuses, and who enter another country seeking asylum, the right to international protection. From the news media reports, I was curious about what was happening there. Were those stories true? Were they exaggerated? I wanted to see for myself. So last November, I jumped at the chance to join a Mercy delegation to El Paso. I was invited here today to talk about those experiences. However, so much has happened since my visit there that in mid-August, I asked my friends at Arise in Alamo, Texas, if I could come and if they would arrange for me to experience what was happening in the Rio Grande Valley. 
The Rio Grande Valley consists of, of towns along the far southern tip of Texas. So McAllen, Alamo, Harlingen, to name a few. Today, I share what I have experienced and learned do, during both of these trips. I visited with service providers for immigrants, respite centers caring for released asylum seekers, border patrol agents, immigration lawyers. My days were filled with powerful experience and learnings that left my heart heavy and at time hopeless about what could be done to change the heartless and inhumane policies and practices against innocent women, men, and children just trying to survive, who want a better life for themselves and their children. Our name is mercy. Our spirit is compassion. These words are in large letters on the wall outside the University Commons. Our name is mercy. Our spirit is compassion. These words are deep in my heart as I focus my talk today on the experiences of the asylum seekers. Men, women, and children with hope in their hearts for a better life. They are fleeing extreme poverty, violence, threats of death by gangs, drug cartels, and others. They are fleeing corruption at every level of society and politics in their home country. International and U.S. law says that a person seeking asylum at our borders cannot be denied entry in order to present their case to the courts. Last November, when I was in El Paso, there were lines of people waiting their turn to present themselves to the Border Patrol and ask for asylum. It was very cold, and the people did not have adequate clothing to protect themselves from the weather. Still, they waited in line, not wanting to lose their place. This continued until Mexico's Beta Force a law enforcement group established to protect the human rights of Im immigrants directed them to shelters, placing their names on a waiting list, assuring them that they would not lose their place. Once a person or families turn to present themselves to the Border Patrol, the agent processes them, taking their personal information, names, home country, birth dates, reason for asylum, and the name and address of the sponsoring family in the United States. Each person is fingerprinted, and they are locked in cage-like cells to wait while their information is verified. Men and women are separated, and generally children are placed with the mother. One can imagine that all of them are exhausted, hungry, and frightened. They are in unfamiliar country and do not speak English. Our name is Mercy and our spirit is compassion. I want to talk a bit more about the cells, those cage-like structures <coughs> where people are held, held as their information is verified. In November, those holding cells were very cold, and they were referred to as the freezers by the immigrants. They were also very crowded. Once immigrants are released and feel comfortable and safe in the shelter, some share their stories with the staff. Two women shared about their experience in the cells. One woman shared about the food. About 4 a.m., she said, someone would come and slide a tray of frozen burritos and juice boxes into the cells and return again at 6 a.m. to take the tray away. 
One morning when they came to get the tray, she exclaimed that her children had not yet eaten. They were still asleep. They took the tray away anyway. Another mother told the story of being released from the holding cell. She asked the Border Patrol agent if her children could see their father before they left, as he was not being released. The agent screamed at her, don't you get it? We don't want you here. You are not welcome here. We want you out. Horrific conditions within the cells have been shown on the news the last couple of months. This summer, reports have been made about conditions in Clint, Texas, and in McAllen, overcrowding to the point of standing room only. One man shared with an ACLU community organizer serving in Texas that he and another man took turns sharing space in the holding cell. One would stand and the other would sit for a while. Then they took turns standing and sitting. Imagine 24 hours a day they would share that spot on the floor, standing and sitting. Before coming to a rise in the Rio Grande Valley, I heard about news reports about the poor conditions inside the centers at McAllen and Clint. Reports about not having adequate food, water, or proper hygiene and sanitary conditions. During my visit to a rise, I asked one of the women if they heard her and seen the reports about McAllen. Her response, I never thought anything like that could exist in the United States. Our name is mercy, our spirit is compassion. By law, no one held, is to be held in the processing cells for more than 72 hours. I was told a little girl was held for seven days. Adults were also held for several days, even weeks. They were often held longer trying to discourage them and break their spirit trying to get them to sign voluntary departure, deportation papers. Voluntary deportation means that they give up their rights for their case of asylum to be heard in the courts. They agree to immediate deportation back to the country and the dangers they were fleeing from. After a person or family is processed and information verified, they are either sent back to Mexico to wait for their court date to present their case for asylum. They are sent to detention centers in the United States or they're released to a sponsor in the United States. I will share a little bit about each of these. January 2019, the U.S. government through the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, issued its new Migrant Protection Protocols, or the Remain in Mexico policy. The Remain in Mexico policy requires certain asylum seekers who pass a credible fear screening with the U.S. asylum officer to return to Mexico and wait their asylum hearing in the U.S. Immigration Court. The Passing the credible fear screening means that they have sufficient documentation that their lives would be in danger if they returned to their home country. And this is the first step in the asi requesting asylum. Casa del Migrante is a safe shelter for immigrants in Reynosa, Mexico, right across from McAllen. Sister Catalina shared about what their organization does. At Casa del Migrante, immigrants can rest, have shelter, food, clothing, as well as medical services if needed. They serve immigrants passing through Reynosa, as well as those who have been picked up by U.S. Border Patrol agents and deported back to Mexico or to their country of origin. Because of the Remain in Mexico policy, 
Casa del Migrante opened a new facility just for asylum seekers who need to wait in Mexico. At this center, they also provide for the personal needs of asylum seekers, including medical and psychological services. Here also the asylum seekers can receive help to obtain proper documentation that they will need when they present their case in the courts if they don't already have all the documentation needed. There is only one lawyer from the U.S. who will come and help the immigrants with their cases. It can be four or five months or longer for the asylum seeker to wait to have their first court appearance in the U.S. In the meantime, these asylum seekers are encouraged to try to rent a place to stay and to get a job. They can try to get a permit to stay in Mexico for a year, as well as get a temporary work permit. But jobs are difficult to find, however, because companies don't want to hire temporary workers. Reynosa is a very dangerous city. Immigrants are often kidnapped, beaten, raped, and or held for ransom by gang members. It is so dangerous that the Border Patrol provides buses to take those who are being deported or immigrants requested, required to wait in Mexico to Casa del Migrante. These buses always have a police escort on board the bus to protect the bus and the immigrants. <coughs> This danger is constantly present while the asylum seeker waits in Mexico. Some asylum seekers, upon release from the processing centers, are sent to detention centers. Mothers and fathers are separated when they are sent to detention centers. Children go with the mother to family detention centers, but it is reported to us by a couple different people we visited with that children two years of age and older continue to be separated from their parents. One person we talked with from the South Texas Civil Rights Projects shared that there doesn't seem to be much oversight in the separation of children. She shared these examples. In one case, a mother and her baby went to present themselves to the agent requesting asylum. The mother had the baby's birth certificate and other documentation, but the agent just looked at her and said, I don't believe that you're the baby's mother and separated the mother from the baby. It took a while, but lawyers went to the consulate and were able to validate the birth certificate However, by this time, the mother had been deported and the child remains in the U.S. Another example, when being processed, the whole history of the person comes up on the computer. There are cases in which a parent's whole history perhaps shows a DUI arrest occurring years before any children were born. But seeing this, the parent is declared unfit and the child or children taken away. The slightest thing that might appear on someone's history can be grounds for separation. One day we visited the Young Center in Harlingen. This agency has its mission to be a child advocate for unaccompanied and separated children. It is a voluntary base, volunteer based program in which arrangements are made for a volunteer to go into the detention center once a week to visit a child, getting to know the child and the child's situation. The center has lawyers who then can make rep recommendations to the appropriate government agency for placement for the child once released from detention. It could be reunited, reunited with their family, sent to a foster family, or deported. The center's lawyers don't advocate for the child in court, but helps the child to get an attorney who can. 
I was shocked to learn that between McAllen and Harlingen, perhaps a 40 mile spread, there are 13 detention centers for children with the capacity of holding 4,000 children ages 0 to 17. With the potential of 4,000 children, the Young Center is currently working with 420 children. It is shocking to me, 4,000 children ages 0 to 17 in an area in 13 detention centers spread in a 40 to 50 mile area. Does this make you ask how many detention centers for children there are in the United States and what the capacity is? Lawyers we met with at the center would not tell us how many children are currently being held, but would only say that the majority of the children are unaccompanied children. I was of the understanding that unaccompanied children meant that they came alone to the border, mostly children in their teens. However, other providers we talked with clarified that an unaccompanied child can also be young children who come to the border with parents and somehow became separated along the way. Perhaps a parent died. Or children come to the border with other family members, aunts or uncles, with the hopes of being united with parents who are already in the United States, but not being the actual parent, these children are taken away. Children separated from parents at the border are immediately classified as unaccompanied. Our name is mercy, our spirit is compassion. A third possibility for persons being held in centers is to be released to a sponsor living in the United States. This release happens once the asylum seeker's information has been verified and that of the sponsor. A sponsor is usually a family member who has agreed to provide and care for the person during the time needed for their asylum case to be heard in the courts. When I was in El Paso, I learned that many times Border Patrol notified providers like Annunciation House that they were bringing X number of immigrants to their centers. However, there have been times when Border Patrol would drop off hundreds at a time at bus stations in El Paso. This also happened in McAllen. How frightening. Those asylum seekers had no money, no phone, no food, didn't really know where they were, many of them, and language was a barrier. Imagine for a minute you being in a place you do not know, having no money, no phone, no food, and not being able to communicate. What a blessing there are volunteers and staff who will pick up these asylum seekers and take them to the centers. The centers receiving the immigrants would welcome them and help them to know that they are safe. They are provided clean clothes, food, medical attention if needed. Volunteers at the centers take their information and the information of their sponsor and help make contact to arrange for transportation to the homes, which could be anywhere in the United States. I had the privilege one evening to volunteer for a couple hours at one of these centers. My job was to show the family to the room in which they would be staying and to invite them to the dining room for dinner. I was sitting at a table with a young boy, perhaps four years of age, and his father. For dessert, volunteers came to each table offering glazed donuts. The little boy, at our table was priceless. He suddenly had a huge grin, took the donut in both hands, and began to eat. 
In Spanish, I asked him if he liked it, and both the child and the father looked at me with big smiles and said yes. Later, thinking about this, I wondered how long it had been since they had had such a treat. I visited La Profeta Providence in San Benito, Texas. Their mission is to provide safe and welcoming place for immigrants and asylum seekers. It is a temporary respite, usually until contacts can be made for transportation and arrangements for them to go to their sponsor. In addition to providing shelter, food, and clothing, La Posada provides individual case management, English as a second language, life skill classes that include employment readiness, and benchmarks for cultural integration. They also provide transportation to and from legal appointments. Sister Zita, the program director, shared two stories of asylum seekers that came to them. One involves a woman from China who was being held in detention in California. Her husband was living legally in Texas and was the sponsor for his wife. His wife was released from detention and was coming to be with him, but had trouble at the airport. Her husband came to La Posada asking for help. His wife had all her documentation, her plane ticket, and was ready to board the plane. However, airport security stopped her and would not let her get on the plane. She was terrified, not knowing what to do. Her husband was frightened also. The advice from La Posada was to wait for another flight and a change in the airport security personnel. This meant having to get a new ticket, which she did. But imagine how you would feel. However, with a new ticket, a change in security personnel, she was able to board the plane and come to La Posada to be with her husband. Another story is about a woman named Maisha from Zimbabwe. She and her husband had led youth groups there. In 2013, she participated in a political protest against the government. Four years later, Maisha was living with her mother some distance from where the protest had taken place. But one day, a few men recognized her. They raped and beat her almost to death. Her mother warned her that she must leave the country. Maisha went to the airport and was planning to go to Ireland. However, some of the airplane crew told her that the same group who attacked her was also in Ireland. They told her that they were coming to the United States and encouraged her to come with them. So landing in the US, Maisha was picked up by Border Patrol and sent to detention. While she was going through the processing, medical tests revealed that she was pregnant from the rape. She had not known this. Because she was pregnant, they released her with a court date and she made her way to La Posada. She arrived in March 2018 and had her first court appearance that August. When it was time for her to go to court, she did not have a lawyer and went alone. However, when she arrived at the court, she saw another woman she recognized as being from a country nearby her country, and she went to talk to her. This woman had a lawyer who was presenting her case to the judge. She asked Maisha if she had a lawyer, and Maisha said no. When the case finished, Maisha was called before the judge. The lawyer returned to her client, who told him that she did not have a lawyer. He heard the judge ask Maisha where her lawyer was, and before she could reply to the, the lawyer immediately replied and said that he was going to be her lawyer also. And he continues to represent her today. September 19th, 
that year, she had her baby. Maisha was able to get a temporary work permit and Las Posada hired her to do work for them. She was to have her third court appearance this past July, but was notified that her parent appearance was moved to next March. In the meantime, her future is uncertain, but she has a place, safe place to stay. And this slide shows her baby being held by some of the arrived staff. In McAllen, we visited the Humanitarian Respite Center sponsored by Catholic Charities of the Rio Grande Valley. Several of the staff of RISE has volunteered at this center. And as with other shelters, the asylum seekers are offered safety and provide provisions for their personal needs. Our name is mercy. Our spirit is compassion. Once the sponsor has made arrangements for travel and paid for their tickets, the asylum seeker begins the journey to their family. This is not always easy as they are not familiar with where they are going. They have no money, no phone, and cannot speak English. Perhaps they have only a few snacks given to them for their travel. Two members of our delegation from El Paso were traveling home and met a woman and her two-year-old son in the Houston airport. Mary could see the confusion and hesitation and recognize that she was one of the asylum seekers. Sister Mary Bilderbach writes of her experience, and I quote, to have had the privilege of accompanying some of the refugees as they tried to navigate the Houston airport the size of a galaxy without language or money. Imagine being a young woman wearing someone else's ill-fitting clothes with a black ice monitor the size of a fat cell phone locked on your ankle with a two-year-old son in one arm and a bag of snacks. Just having walked 19 days to get out of Honduras. Imagine facing the airport escalator for the first time and the roar of the plane's engines taking off and landing. Your first flight with no explanation for the noise and no information about restrooms or where to find clean water." End quote. Jean Stoken, Justice Coordinator for Immigration and Nonviolence at our Institute Justice Office, shares her experience while volunteering at Annunciation House in El Paso. And I quote, one story from today. After having received a Guatemalan woman and her son a few days ago and having her family send a bus ticket, I took her to the Greyhound to get her on the bus to West Palm Beach, Florida. At the bus station, only when they asked her to sign the ticket did she say she could not read or write, at least not in Spanish. She only spoke an indigenous dialect, barely could understand Spanish. The bus trip would take two days and seven transfers of buses to Florida if you can believe it. She began to weep. And I was eventually able to connect her with others who were doing the same trip, at least to the first four cities and transfers. But please keep the good people in your prayers. How would we manage in a strange country with no money, no phone, without the ability to communicate and having gone through terrorizing experiences just trying to be safe. Our name is mercy, our spirit is compassion. A refreshing experience I had regarding travel was about the angry tias and abuelas, the angry aunts and grandmothers, 
This is a volunteer group that started several years ago when they heard about a group of immigrants stranded on the bridge between Reynosa and McAllen. They organized to see how they might be able to help immigrants. We met Susan, one of the group leaders, at the McAllen bus station. When asylum seekers are dropped off at the bus station, volunteers meet them and accompany them to the Humanitarian <coughs> Respite Center, which is right across the street. This is the respite place where they can stay until their sponsor is contacted and sends travel arrangements. Once they have the travel arrangements and come to the airport or to the bus station, the angry Tias and Abuelas again meet them. Susan or some of the other members of the group check their ticket and travel schedule to be sure the arrival and departure times are correct. On a map, they show them where their stops will be along the way and help them understand where they are, will be going. With permission, they ask them to see their documents. Often, there is no date set for the court appearance, just an address for the court. But sometimes, there is no address for the court. This means that they would have to come back to Harlingen, Texas, no matter where they are going in the United States. Susan would give them an 800 number to call to change the location for the court cautioning them that if they didn't change the location and they couldn't come back to Harlingen for their court appearance, they will get deported with no opportunity to present their case to the court. She also advises them to get a lawyer. Their paperwork should contain a list of lawyers and places to call. However, lawyers sometimes can't help them because they have too many cases. Susan advises them that if this is the case, to ask for any recommendations or what other options they may have. When the time comes for their departure, the angry Tias and Abuelas make sure they get on the right bus. The day we were at the bus station, 22 asylum seekers came, and this was a very low number compared to other days. We learned that there are groups of angry Tias and Abuelas at various bus stations across the country. What a wonderful support to those not understanding where they are going or what they might encounter on the way. So what's the next part of the asylum seekers story? Last November, our delegation visited the Diocesan Migrant and Refugee Center in El Paso and learned that it can take three to five years for a case to be finalized in the courts. And now with the crowded courts, it can take even longer. Asylum seekers can apply for authorization to work after their case has been pending for 150 days. The percentages of cases in which asylum has been granted varies from state to state. According to the fiscal year 2016 statistics, El Paso has only 2% of the cases with a positive outcome, whereas New York City has an 85% cases being granted. In total for that year, 43% of the cases have been granted asylum. All of these families seeking asylum have a difficult, long, and uncertain future. Imagine what it would be like to make that long journey undergoing many hardships along the way, enduring harsh treatment of agents and others, attending many court hearings over a period of seven, several years, and then face deportation, being sent back to a country in which their lives will be in danger. During this past year, I've made two trips to Texas border to learn about immigration meeting many organizations and groups. They have shared with me stories about asylum seekers trying to stay alive and get safety for their families. I have read and listened to many news reports. Personally, I cannot unsee what I have seen, nor can I unhear the truth in what I have learned. Can you? 
So how do we respond? Our name is mercy. Our spirit is compassion. Thank you. or comments and I know people are on time schedules so uh, for about five minutes any comments or questions <coughs> Thank you. And it is important. I'll just reiterate, we're so far away from what's happening that it can be out of our minds in a second. Sister Kathy. Brenda Hagner. Brenda Hagner from Ward Hall. Thank you and God bless you for sharing those with us today. I'd like to know where else you have spoken in Cedar Rapids and shared your message and your story. Um, or if not see around as other places. Yeah, I've shared my story mostly at Sacred Heart with the sisters and then here. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Kathy, in situations where a child is stuck, comes with a parent and is separated, like the uh, case you described, and the, the parent is deported, is, is there any possibility of the children in that situation being reunited with their parents? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, if the parents are already deported to Mexico, I think it might be more difficult. I don't know what the process is, and that process seems to change rapidly. from the Ed Department. Um, this is incredibly powerful, and um, I wanted to also say to people here that many people in Iowa are saying the border is also here, and there's lots of families living in danger here, particularly children whose parents are being deported, not mm -hmm. through the asylum program, um, and currently there's a program called Freedom for Immigrants in Eastern Iowa that's organizing, and that's something I'm getting involved with. If you're interested, let me know not to capitalize on this. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're working particularly on setting up a visitation program for those in detention here in Lynn County. So, mm -hmm. thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you for doing that. Thank you, sister. I am from the Rio Grande Valley ah. of Texas. And Great. so when I go home, I get to hear some of these stories yeah. and to see them. And it is heartbreaking. Yeah. Thank However, you. I do think that we as a citizen need to talk to our representatives in the national legislature. They have to address the immigration laws. I don't think that we can take all the people around the world who are in these kinds of situations to come solely here. Mm -hmm. We need to pressure, put pressure on those leaders in those governments to do right by their people. There's a lot of corruption mm -hmm. in many places around the world. Most people don't want to leave their homes to yeah. go somewhere else. Yeah. Most people want to stay where they are. So they're coming because they have dire, abject poverty. They're in 
dire situations where you have violence occurring, drugs, lots of other obstacles, lack of education, as well as medical care that they don't have. We need to, as a society, pressure our government, which is one of the most powerful governments in the world, to make sure that those um, leaders do the right thing, whether it's sanctions or other things of that nature. Well, Kathy, on behalf of Mount Mercy, we are very grateful to you mm -hmm. because you. today you took these words that are inscripted on our wall and through the voices as well as through the lives of the people that you have been with, you've made these words real, especially in terms of immigration and the devastation that is happening in our border. And mm -hmm. we're very Thank, Thank you. you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you did a very fine job. Thank Thanks. You. you are very welcome. Pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Get some lunch. <laughs> <laughs>